Well, good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Sunday for Sunday, February 5th, 2023. We've got another great show for you this week. We've got members of the media, academia, financial services, and government standing by as we analyze all the news and events for the week. So sit back, relax, enjoy this episode of BRN Sunday. Well, the same old story. We're going to kick off the week in the show with a look at what's happening on with legislation, regulation, and litigation. And joining me on the line, he is one half of the Legal Eagles, Kevin Walsh. He's a principal with Groom Law Group. That's an employee benefits law firm based in Washington, D.C. Kevin, thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Jeff, thanks for having me on. It's always good to talk to you and your listeners. Yeah, and, and it's always nice every once in a while to have one eagle. And it allows us to focus on an issue. Uh, Kevin, what's going on in the rulemaking department? I think the uh, Office of Management and Budget has been fairly busy. They have been. So, you know, the the Department of Labor has had a a very robust regulatory agenda for the last year, and we expect more regs later this year. Um, And really the last step before regulation is finalized is it has to be signed off on by the Office of Management and Budget. So as we refer to that as the White House signing off before it's finally published. And uh, just on Thursday, uh, the White House finally signed off on a rule related to uh, annual plan reporting. So, uh, Jeff, I mean, are you familiar with Form 5500? Yes, unfortunately, I am very familiar with Form 5500, both the 5500 and the 5500 EZ. Yeah, and what Form yeah, and what Form 5500 is, is it is the, you know, standard reporting template. It's the standard form that each plan has to submit to the Labor Department each year. And it discloses information like, you know, the number of participants, the number of vested participants, the number of terminated participants, um, plan expenses. So information related to, um, you know, who your service providers are, what you're paying your service providers, um, information like that. Um, so in short, it provides, you know, a real wealth of information. And, you know, if we look back at what happened in, you know, 2018, 2019, 2020, we saw the, you know, enactment of SECURE, the SECURE Act, which created new types of plans, uh, pooled employer plans. Mm -hmm. And as part of that uh, legislative initiative, uh, the Labor Department was told to, you know, go back and take a look at Form 5500 and figure out, you know, do amendments need to be made for, you know, pooled employer plans in particular, um, but as part of that initiative, DOL has also been looking at, you know, are changes needed for plans more broadly? Um, so, you know, one alternative to a pooled employer plan is to have, you know, a group of identical plans, so like a group of plans. Um, or, you know, would DOL like to get additional information about individual plans? Um, are there ways to break out information that would be helpful to them? Uh, would they rather get some of this information in a more machine-readable format? Uh, So I think in the next week or so, what we're likely to see is we're likely to see a final rule, which will, you know, modernize Form 5500 in DOL's eyes, uh, at least with respect to pooled employer plans, and quite possibly make changes to require more detailed reporting on fees and expenses more broadly. So, so Kevin, what is this? uh, Just to familiarize everyone, the OMB, that that means that that's part of the White House, right? That's the executive branch. So... The, these rules would be issued. There would be a comment period, and then a response. No, no this would, they would be issued. No, this is it. This, this is, is it. it. So there, these these rules were proposed um, about a year ago, okay. um, and so what's coming out now are final rules. And then, so what will happen is, you know, they'll be published. There will be some period of time prior to when they take effect. Usually, rules don't have an immediate effective date, but they'll have an effective date of, you know, some date six months out, one year out, or plan years beginning on or after. Uh, with respect to a reporting rule, my guess is that they'll do something like plan years beginning on or after will be the effective date. Mm-hmm. Um, and that'll provide, you know, some timeline for, you know, folks to read the new form um, and get comfortable with the new form before they're forced to begin using it. And and let's carry this forward to the industry side. 
people who complete 5500 there's a lot the record keepers usually contribute information to that there's usually a independent audit that is done i think for plans with over 100 employees if i'm not mistaken you have to correct me if i'm wrong yes um, yeah you're right so there's a lot that has to go into providing this information and it's got to be available uh, on the record keeping system be able to be pulled yeah, so whatever information DOL says they ultimately need, you know, folks will be stuck designing systems around. So sometimes reporting rules fly under the radar because, it, you know, it's not as though we're creating brand new prohibited transactions or saying you can't do something or you're allowed to do something from an investment standpoint. It's not as, you know, hot a topic as ESG, but making changes to reporting rules can make a, a big difference in terms of administrative burden, process designs, and putting in place new systems. And, and to your point, it doesn't always have to mean more work. This can mean less work because a lot of the a lot of the fifty five hundred prep work can be automated. I mean, I was as a record keeper, a reform record keeper. Now, I had to run reports to get the counts that go into the fifty five hundred. So th- this could conceivably make the work, as you're suggesting, easier for the record keeper, reduce the administrative burden, and make it easier for the sponsor who is ultimately responsible for filing that fifty five hundred. Yeah, I mean, I, I would hope that in the modernization of it, we see more streamlined reporting. And we recognize that, that, you know, some information that was relevant in an era of DB plans, you know, 30 years ago may, may, may no longer be relevant. Um, but this is one of those times where we're going to have to wait and see um, and see how much they do with respect to individual plans and how much this rule simply focuses on uh, the brand new topic of pooled employer plans. Yeah, well, but I, I would hope if they do simplification, they do it more broadly. But you know, we should know in the next few days, Jeff. Yeah, I'm, look, I'm, I'm excited, Kevin, and I know that uh, maybe we'll talk about this again next week once the once the rule is um, is finally issued. We can get yours and David's or, or whomever's uh, opinion. And you know, one thing I would like to talk about maybe if we can next week is I think the committee assignments may have been finalized, and there have been changes in Congress and a new. House of Representatives majority and maybe a change in the uh, the configuration of the Senate. So maybe that might be a good topic to talk about next week. I think that's a great topic for next week, Jeff, because the committee assignments got finalized over the last few days, and you know they're going to start holding hearings pretty soon. Um, I've been looking <laughs> at House Financial Services, and they've got you know hearings related to privacy, relating to accredited investor. Uh, they've got a whole bunch of things coming up that I think our listeners would be interested in. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Kevin, thanks so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Give our best to your colleague, David Levine, and we'll talk to you again very soon. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Thank thanks, you, buddy. listeners. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you got to start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're going to change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and call Credit Repair for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house 
and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. Now we're going to take a spin around the markets. Joining us on the line, he's the lead anchor for the TD Ameritrade Network, Oliver Rennick. Oliver, thanks so much for joining us this this morning. Absolutely. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Let's start off with your reaction and the market's reaction to the quarter point increase by, increase by our friends at the Federal Reserve. How do you see it? Uh, this was expected, 25 bips. And uh, the tone, though, was a bit surprising. Um, I believe that Powell had a very uh, surprising about face from his hawkish talent at Jackson Hole at the end of last year. Uh, I kind of expected him to generally do what the market wanted, but his lack of real strong pushback against the notion of interest rate cuts, as well as the upward momentum in asset prices, to me was very surprising. The stock market has been breaking through technical levels and rallying to an extent we have not seen in more than a year. And the Fed has explicitly told us before that if asset prices rise too much, it can counteract their mission in the economy by loosening financial conditions. So to me, this is a very big deal that Powell has not – uh, acknowledged that in a way that would worry him. He was given every opportunity to address higher stock prices, loosening financial conditions, and the overall calm in the bond market, which is pretty directly going against him. Bond market still is pricing in cuts. He says that uh, that's not necessarily going to happen, but at this point he's only giving lip service when he doesn't bring anything new and hawkish to the table when markets go against them the way they have. So if you look at financial conditions as measured by Goldman, Bloomberg, Chicago Fed, the ways that we assess whether or not the economy is loosening, tightening, they have loosened. And financial conditions are the most favorable they've been in a year, which seemingly directly contradicts what the Fed is trying to do. And so with the strong jobs market and without any obvious pain in the employment sector just yet, apart from tech layoffs, which are arguably uh, very natural given the huge COVID tech boom, there is no real discernible negativity in the employment picture. So the loosening financial conditions should empower the Fed to be more aggressive because inflation is still way too high. If they really mean that they want to get inflation under 2% and fast, then they would be hiking. They would be more directly contradicting the market's expectations for cuts. They might be unwinding the balance sheet. They might be doing something, anything other than basically exactly what markets have priced in. And so Powell refusing to do any of that basically either means one, he is completely subservient to the market, and he is the market's subject and will do what investors tell him, or he's not very serious about getting inflation down because he's so worried about the economy. But then when he says that the economy looks okay with jobs, then we must conclude that he, he either has no conviction of his own beyond what the market tells him, or he's lying about the economy and – is not serious about inflation. So it, to me, is by far, um, for the first time, really, a moment where I, I find myself at very great odds with um, what the what the Fed is specifically saying. I'm not somebody that's like a Fed hater. I never really have been. I think Powell has generally done what he's had to do. 
But this was, um, I think, going to turn out to be probably his worst moment. And then, lo and behold, the next day we get a massive jobs beat um, and a dollar rising again, which suggests that he might be letting the door open to inflation by not pressing the brake harder right now. Oliver, after the Great Depression was over, a lot of people saying happy days are here again. So are investors singing happy days are here again? Is this a reality? Stock the- market is. Well, the stock market is, and and I'm I'm sitting on the side. You know, I'm not in the stock. I'm in the stock market in the sense that I'm an investor, and there are a lot of people who are investors. But is it time to kind of take the to wipe the brow and say, "Whew, we made it." Well, the stock market is trading as if that is the case to some extent. However, there. And Powell does kind of seem like in his language, he wants to take a breather and figure out the impacts of what he's done and not upset the apple cart too much. But the data suggests that, no, we're absolutely nowhere even close to being in the clear. There is still inflation at 5%, which is far too high. And leading economic indicators continue to show deterioration Everything outside of the job situation shows recessionary-like indications. And I believe that this time around, jobs may not be a very good indicator because of our COVID pandemic stimulus. People are taking jobs at a lower income than what they made from the government combined with their asset price gains and winnings in securities. And that is really complicating the picture here where people think because jobs are going up, that the situation is improving, but for many people, they're taking these jobs begrudgingly or working multiple to make up for the lifestyle that they had a year and a half ago. Oliver, you mentioned the technology companies' layoffs. So that's Amazon, Meta, uh, some of the other big Google, another one. Um, you know, this is no longer a Zoom centric economy, or at least a lot of businesses aren't working that way anymore. Do those Companies come back? Do they reinvent themselves? Does, does, for example, ad revenue soar back? Uh, maybe Twitter's another one where they had a lot of layoffs as well. So does ad revenue come back? What Does the model still work for tech? Well, it, um, it works, but it doesn't really grow that much anymore. Uh, that's the main uh, big change here that we're seeing, which I think is fine. It's uh, the ultimate destination is to become a – profitable, reliable, dividend-paying enterprise. That's essentially the path that Netflix and Meta are on. Apple has already been there. Um, And that transition from being high-growth, high-octane sales growth to more stable, more reliable, is ultimately where these companies are going. And that's perfectly fine. What it means, though, is that the stocks are probably not going to be as rewarding They'll probably never trade at the same valuations. I don't think that we will ever see valuations for big tech companies that we saw during COVID ever again. Um, That doesn't mean the stock prices can't go higher eventually when they pile up earnings over the next 10, 20 years. But they're very different investments. And so the market was really excited to see some of that from Meta in particular, which is a really good example of this. But you also saw it in Netflix throughout the last six months seeing companies transition from high-growth disruptors to essentially new service utilities of our era uh, is a very cool thing to see. It just is unlikely to be as rewarding a stock investment from a price appreciation standpoint. Well, I guess we're going to see in the coming weeks and months, and here we are the end of January into February, our happy days here again. We're going to find out. Oliver Rennick, always good to chat with you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. We'll talk to you again very soon, my friend. Thanks, Jeff. Bye-bye. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Sunday. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest curated news and lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more all in one place. That's right, one place. Check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to search our archives, check out our latest content, or visit our website, and of course, all of our streaming partners. We're back again tomorrow for another edition of BRN AM. You're not going to want to miss it. We've got a very special guest. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes.